Uh, yes. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, a very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. So, uh, thank you so much, Professor Claudio, for uh, giving me an introduction. Uh, I am Professor Hanuman Rao, faculty member at School of Infrastructure of Indian Institute of Technology, Bhuvaneshwar. So I thank you so much again, for, uh, Professor Reddy, for giving this opportunity to uh, share our research outcome. So that is an importance of tailing characterization for sustainable management of the tailing stamps. So before I begin my presentation, so let me also thank all of my uh, MTech, BTech, and PhD students. So these are. So these are my uh, broad research interests. Uh, basically, I'm working on ground improvement and uh, geo-environmental engineering with a focus on uh, geotechnics and the valorization of the waste materials and management of the tailings. So let me go into the presentation of the tailings management. Uh, though it has been abandoned, the uh, deposition of tailings in the riverine and submarine, so currently, uh, most of the tailings are deposited in the ponds or the impoundments and at a few locations it is also deposited in the underground mines but in various forms so maybe in the slurry farm or maybe in the paste paste farm or if possible the slurries are converted into some moisture tailings and they are dry stacked so the for the understanding of the general reader uh, I have just given different types of tailing stamps. So, which may be like uh, valley impoundments or dug pits or in pit impoundments or ring pits, depending upon the availability of the space and depending upon the design that permits, one can adapt to any one type of these uh, tailing stamps. Now, when it comes to the tailings, it is this important factor that is catastrophic failure of a several tailings facility, which has led to research. So in a phenomenal way on tailings management. So when a tailing facility failure has happened, a million of tons of uh, waste material will be flown, uh, which has a phenomenal impact on the ground or on the geo environment, which is above and below. So as you can notice from these pictures, so when uh, any catastrophic failure occurs, it completely inundates huge area, which is a phenomenon. And the impact of the area, which is inundated by the tailings, is a perennial. So we cannot able to rehabilitate in a short period of a time. And uh, these tailings can cause the damage to the even subsurface, including the groundwater. Now, when we talk about the tailings, there are a variety of the tailing materials are available. So here it is shown or we can say the catastrophic failure is not confined only to the one type of the tailings like a bauxite residue or a red mud or there are a cases reported on failure of the iron ore tailings so across the world so similarly gold mine tailings which have been failed again across the world or coal tailings which have been failed across the world so this shows that it is not only one type of the tailings material that undergoes the failure. But if you look at closely the mechanism of the tailings facility, so there are six to seven broad components are involved. First, these tailings are deposited in a slurry form with very high or significant water content. So this has led to very high water level. And at the same time, because of the difference in the specific gravity or a difference in the type of the discharge, there is an immediate segregation and separation of the particles and water. And among the particles, fine particles will be flown away into one place and the coarser particles will flown away into another place. Now, this segregation will again cause some kind of or have an impact on the overall health of a tailing stamp. For example, wherever there are fine tailings, so they may undergo or they can exhibit some kind of the compressible behavior with low permeability or when load is applied on these fine tailings. So they may undergo what you call as a collapse. So these are the possible problems. And with change in the climate, so there are unpredictable rains or heavy rains, which can also cause 
catastrophic failure in the form of overtopping or erosion or excess seepage. And besides the seepage through the dike or the piping phenomenon through the foundation soil. So all these can cause a catastrophic failure of a tailing facility. Now, if you look at this mechanism, so it inherently highlights that it is not only the one phenomenon that we need to take care. So we need to take into multiple parameters at the same time account for so that the tailing facility is safe. So based on the literature, what are the different important characteristics that need to be focused? So here I have uh, tried to list it out those different uh, parameters, which are starting from uh, the unique chemical composition of the each tailing, physical dust emission, groundwater pollution because of the leachate, poor utilization of the tailings material, release of toxic elements, or dike failure causing the dam break analysis, or inherent health hazards, or extreme erosion. Now, if you look at all these uh, characteristics, many of them are new, uh, which we might not have come across in case of the soils. The another important factor is when we try to deal with the tailings, we need to deal uh, many of the parameters simultaneously. So that's what I'm going to present in this presentation. Now, for example, when we deal with only the conventional soils, we always talk about only the strength improvement. But a few of the tailings, uh, contrary to our thinking, they can also exhibit plastic behavior or volume change behavior randomly. So we cannot able to say that uh, this particular tailing will exhibit low volume change or high volume change. It can do anything. Apart from that, because of their unique chemical compositions, the tailings can exhibit at the same time low strength, collapse potential, dispersion, or depending upon the waste type. So some waste might exhibit some kind of high alkalinity. So the challenge lies in how shall we address the multiple characteristics together? Now, though we cannot able to directly link the graph presented here with the unique chemical composition, but we try to understand when we have compiled different tailings materials or the waste materials, which includes the tailings also. Uh, what we can notice is, so there is a significant difference in the compaction characteristics, which is one of the critical parameters uh, for utilization or in terms of the uh, valorization of the utilization. Now here you can notice a few waste materials are showing very high uh, the optimum water content, while a few of them are showing very low water content with very high density value. So these can be corroborated to the unique chemical composition of that particular waste or the tailing material. Now this is also uh, another important observation. So here you can notice uh, all the slags are exhibiting one unique uh, the compaction behavior, while the natural soils, playa, sharkailenite, they are very similar. On the other hand, another kind of the waste materials like the rice or scarcity is exhibiting the different compaction char characteristics. Now, if there is a distinction in the compaction characteristics, then how do you recommend these materials for the stabilization or the utilization? Now, this problem will further depend when the same waste will exhibit inconsistency in the density water content relationship that is consistency. So these graphs are presented for one kind of the tailings material that is a bauxite residue where we can see. So these graphs are produced by our research scholars. So when we have done the standard proper compaction test, we never got any consistent gamma D value on the OFC. While when we have started to the modified compaction test, we got the consistent values of uh, the gamma D and OMC, but still at lower moisture contents, these tailings materials started exhibiting some kind of sensitivity to water content. So then how do you deal with when the water content is lower of the tailings material? And, uh, and the another compilation is uh, in the above graph, this is the bauxite residue of the same horizon. But when we try to superimpose the same tailing, but with a different horizon, again, they started exhibiting the different, uh, the relative uh, the density and water content relationship. So the question comes is, uh, which density or the water content shall be taken for the practical purpose? 
So these are the typical variable values of the water contained for different waste materials. So it can go at the optimum water contained can go as low as 7% to as high as 130%. Similarly, the maximum dry density could be as high as 23.2 to as low as 4.2. So you can see a phenomenal difference in the optimum moisture content as well as the density values. Now, let me go into the important topic that is uh, the utilization of the tailings or the management of the tailings. So one of the aspect of the management tailings is uh, the utilization aspect. Uh, Dr. Rao, we cannot hear you. I have taken an example of the tailings material of the red mud. So these are the physical and chemical properties of the bauxite residue, or uh, which is also called as a red mud. Now, if you look at the physical characteristics of the bauxite residue, the pH is very, very high, which is not acceptable as for the relevant course. While if you look at the chemical compositions, so contrary to conventional soil, so there is almost a huge amount of the iron content in it. Now, if you make a comparison of tailings material with the additive contents. Here you can see how the additives or other tailings materials are different uh, among themselves. So another important uh, feature is for majority of the tailings material, uh, if you try to establish the mineralogical characteristics or the morphological characteristics, so often you may find or you may not be finding the mineral which is generally uh, visible in case of the soils. Now, if you look at the bauxite tailings, you can see the minerals which are commonly not found in any ordinary soil. Now, here I'm dealing with the bauxite residue. So that is called as a red mud. So in this case, the high alkalinity is caused by the various minerals present in it, which include the sodalite, cancrinite, hydrogarnite, or tricalcium silicate, or so in the form of if you talk about the anions, which are hydroxyls, carbonates, bicarbonates, aluminum hydroxide, so on and so forth. Now, any one or combination of these anions could contribute for high alkalinity in the tailings material. Uh, here, high alkalinity means which is exhibiting the pH of almost about 10. Now, when you want to neutralize these tailings material, so unless otherwise you completely uh, make a reaction or dissolve these anions. So we cannot able to reduce the alkalinity. And for that purpose, we can use, uh, there are well established techniques, which includes acid water slurry treatment or use of mineral acids and organic acids for neutralization purpose or admixing of the lime or otherwise use of acid gases such as CO2 or SO2. And nowadays, uh, one of the techniques that is uh, emerging is use of bioacids so that it will not be having any kind of the pollution footprint on the environment. However, uh, the challenge lies is, uh, suppose if you look at these anions, now will these all anions get released simultaneously or are they time bound? So this is a million dollar question. So when we have tried to work, uh, work it on the bauxite residue, what we found is, so these release of anions from the minerals will not happen simultaneously. So it is a time bound phenomenon. Now let me also show all those results. Now for stabilization purpose, uh, we have considered three, three variety of additives, which include conventional additives like slag, flyas, gypsum, or Portland cement, or uh, chemical additives like uh, sodium chloride, hydrochloric acid, or organic acids like oxalic acid and citric acid, on the other hand, we also try to use the biopolymers for strength improvement of the tailings material so that they are useful for practical purposes. So these are a few of the results uh, on the left side. So these are the improvement in the strength when we have admixed or treated with the OPC that is a cement, GGBS that is a slag or combination of slag and the GGBS. Now, if you look at the right side, so you can see a peculiar phenomenon when we have tried to stabilize the bauxite with the gypsum so it did not make any kind of a reaction it says the gypsum is not an additive for uh, treating the bauxite residue but 
as we know that gypsum is one of the very good additive when we try to deal with the conventional materials but it didn't work in case of the uh, tailings material but we could able we could able to get a significant amount of the strength when we have treated with the conventional additives so similarly we also try to use the organic acids like the citric acid uh, because we selected the citric acid for the two purposes one is it is uh, its ph is very low so that it can neutralize at the same time it can induce the strength so with that in intention we have used organic acids like the citric acid or oxalic acid and we also try to use the combination of the lime plus the organic acids so we got uh, very low strength it is less than 1 megapascal and we also try to stabilize this material using the biopolymers so by admixing within the range of 0.5 to 1% so as compared with organic acids biopolymer showed a good reaction and with good strength so that is up to 1 megapascal or 1.5 megapascal now for few of the tailings materials where they exhibit significant affinity to water content so in that cases we can try to use the novel additive like a graphene oxide so one of my master student he tried to stabilize the bauxite residue uh, with the combination of the graphene oxide as well as the lime so these are the few results so the beauty of graphene oxide is this is a very thin sheet with uh, approximately 1.1 nanometer but exhibits significant affinity to water content so wherever there is a high water content problem so we can recommend the use of the graphene oxide so by admixing the graphene oxide in uh, small proportions along with the lime so we try to stabilize the bauxite residue and try to find it out the unconfined compressive strength uh, with a curing period of 7 days or 21 days or we also try to understand the durability characteristics of the tailings material in the long uh, longer period so these are the results so at uh, 7 or 21st days we got uh, significant strength so which is almost more than 2 megapascals while uh, when we have conducted the durability test by immersing the samples uh, in the water for about seven days in alternate cycles. So we still got the strength of more than 1.5 megapascals, which is a significantly high. So another important aspect when we try to deal with the tailings materials is, so dispersion, erosion, and dust emission. So dispersion, so because of the pure uh, chemical phenomena or uh, erosion. So most of the waste materials, they are vulnerable for erosion problem. So this is a very severe phenomenon. And uh, the most important aspect of this erosion is that, so this is so rapid. So the erosion, a significant amount of erosion can happen overnight, leading to the progressive failure of tailing specific. So therefore, uh, in terms of the erosion, so the uh, tailings authority should be very, very careful because uh, at the time at the time of day the tailings facility seems to be all right if there is an uh, rainfall in the night time by the time tomorrow you visit the site you see that a significant uh, erosion that might have occurred overnight and this erosion becomes rapid with the fluvial process condition or depending upon the uh, runoff here you can notice uh, this all erosion how cavities have been formed these cavities have a depth of uh, almost more than six meter or seven meter now uh, this these photographs i have tried to click it when i made a site visit so these are the typical erosion problems on the tailings facility so here you can see how erosion has started at the toe of the dike or the toe of the embankment now there is a another interesting uh, philosophy among the engineering community those are dealing with the tailings facility is what kind of uh, gra uh, turfing that should be maintained so somebody argues we should use only the grass somebody argues we should only use the uh, tree uh, tall trees so when i made a site visit to some particular tailing facility so this is what i have noticed so interestingly wherever there are some bushes or the grass so that showed a well protection against the erosion and wherever there is a tall trees are there that surrounding has uh, showed feel protected from the erosion so this uh, demonstrates that it is better to go for a small kind of the shrubs uh, rather than planting a, a big trees now 
another uh, important problem with the tailings materials is a fugitive dust emission so this basically happens because of the large uh, exposure surface area now uh, in order to mitigate all the three problems simultaneously we try to use biopolymers like chindangang and gaurgam so we have conducted some uh, some modified crumb test so using both gaurgam and uh, chindangang so as per the relevant aastm code so here we found uh, one of the biopolymers is exhibiting or giving very encouraging results to mitigate the dispersion behavior and the same we can also notice from the scm graphs so here what we notice is these biopolymers will not chemically react with the material rather they encapsulate and thereby bind the particles which is essential when you want to mitigate the dispersion behavior so these are again the same dispersion test uh, using l means the lime and g means a graphene oxide that is a novel additive so alternatively we can also use the combination of the lime or the graphene oxide for mitigating the dispersion behavior but at particular percentage uh, the combination of the lime and the graphene oxide exhibited a good uh, dispersion mitigation behavior but other negative aspects also we have seen suppose if excessive content of the biopolymer is added for stabilization purpose they can even cause some kind of the swelling or the cracking to the material so these are the peculiar things so in our case when we have admixed 3% of the jindangam or 2% of the bio uh, gaurgam so it induced some kind of the swelling in the material as well as cracking in the material recommending that low percentages of biopolymers are useful as compared to the high percentages and we also try to assess the long term performance uh, in the same by measuring the ecs so they also exhibited the same so when the biopolymer content is uh, exceeding certain amount so there is no use now one of my mtech student she is conducting uh, the performance of these biopolymers in mitigating the dust emission so we got very encouraging results here we can see so we use some kind of the fan arrangement uh, mimicking a particular wind speed and we put some kind of the light uh, which is mimicking the dry condition or uh, maintaining the particular temperature so this light is connected to some sensor so that whenever the temperature exceeds that particular feed value it automatically puts off thereby so all surrounding uh, the surface it almost try to maintain a uniform temperature uh, which is almost very similar to the field condition uh, but wind is uh, continuous so we got very encouraging results so here we have added uh, the biopolymer of 1 liter per square meter which is uh, slightly higher we want to reduce the same thing and we try to use 0.2% of the biopolymer uh, over the surface area so here also what we have, what we have seen is these biopolymers are able to bind the uh, material and thereby mitigate the dust emission so earlier i showed the dispersion erosion and the dust emission so that means a uh, biopolymers are one of the effective uh, additives uh, simultaneously mitigating the erosion dispersion as well as the dust emission now as i told one of the peculiar phenomenon that we have noticed when we have tried to stabilize the tailings material is rebound of the ph uh, everybody stabilizes the waste material or the tailings materials with the different additives which includes the lime or the graphene oxide or layers of gypsum but when we try to go for the geo environmental characterization which includes measurement of the ph so they may not be satisfying your criterion so your ph is very very high and as for the few pores so this ph so this ph may not be acceptable for example as for the irc pore the ph of the geo material should lie between 8.5 to 9 uh, behind this that particular material is not advisable so if you look at these additives uh, which has been uh, used as a stabilizer stabilizers the post ph is more than 9 so they may not be accepted similarly when we try to use the citric acid or the gypsum or the combination of the cement or the slag almost in every case there is a rebound of the ph now this rebound has to be quantified and the same rebound is happened when we have tried to stabilize the bauxite residue with nitric acid or the hydrochloric acid 
Now, when we try to use the hydrochloric acid, we require so high quantity of the uh, hydrochloric acid. So it could be able to neutralize the material, but the chlorates are so high, it is still not acceptable. Similarly, the rebound in case of the nitric acid is also so high. Now, having understood the material exhibits a pH rebound, we try to understand can we able to quantify or can we able to capture what is the rate of rebound over a uh, curing period. So that's what all these graphs are presented here. We try to measure the rate of pH rebound with a curing period and we try to fit uh, or we try to measure the slope of this rebound. So when we try to put it in the form of a graph, so it exhibited some kind of the bilinear relationship up to certain period of time, the increase of the rate of pH rebound is high, thereafter it became almost constant. So thereby, we have given some kind of a designations like the rate of rebound or the termination of the rebound or the maximum rebound period, all these things. And this terminology is unique for each tailings. So now, when we are trying to deal with the management of any tailings, you also need to account for the measurement of the pH rebound and try to analyze whether it shows a high amount of the pH rebound or the low amount of the pH rebound or what curing period of time. If it is very rapid, then there is no uh, point of stabilizing that particular tailing. So again, uh, these are the values of the measurements, that is a rate of rebound. Uh, with here in this case, uh, the stabilizing agent is the citric acid, oxalic acid, along with the lime. So these are a few results of the rate of rebound with the molarity of that particular organic acid. So here, uh, one point, for example, if you look at this graph, one point five molarity of the citric acid or the oxalic acid found to be optimal. So I can use, or I can recommend one point five molarity of citric acid or organic acid, uh, maybe in case of the field trials also. Now, another important aspect is release of potentially toxic elements, that is PTEs, because these PTEs play an important role in the contamination of the uh, subsurface or the subsurface geoenvironment, or for that matter, the performance of the HDPE liner system, uh, either in the form of a leakage or in the form of a tearing or seam puncture, so on and so forth. So uh, when we try to establish the potentially toxic elements of the bauxite residue, uh, so these are the results uh, we have analyzed for the different elements. Uh, almost uh, majority of the elements are within the permissible limits, except a few uh, like those are heavy metals or the toxic elements like chromium or uh, lead or manganese, so on and so forth. Uh, we also have to uh, have a comparison with uh, different standards, which includes US drinking water standards or US EPA. But majority of this PTS concentration fall well within the uh, US EPA, uh, but does not uh, meet the criteria of US drinking water standards. But of course, we are not going to use this particular criteria. And uh, these are uh, the analysis of PTEs of uh, amended tailings material. So, for example, uh, bauxite residue amended with the citric acid or bauxite residue amended with the slag plus OPC. So, these amendments showed some kind of immobilization of the potentially toxic element. So, therefore, so they not only stabilize the waste material, but they also had some kind of the immobilizing agents for uh, release of the potentially toxic elements. Now, another important aspect uh, that is the dam break analysis of the tailings material. This is one of the most important thing. So when you try to deal with the uh, tailings facility. Now here, uh, if you look at this picture, uh, we may deposit the tailings either in the form of a slurry into the pond. So as we know, the breach of this will lead to the outflow of the tailings material. But when it is outflow, so there is some particular yeah. parameter or that highly depends upon the rheology of that particular tailings material. So the rheology of the tailings material is least understood by majority of the research community. So we need to understand. So what is the runout distance? What would be the area of the impact? What would be the velocity? So on and so forth. So that these parameters will give a first hand information on identifying the potential impacted areas or for that matter, evacuation of the villages or the people so that we can minimize the casualties. So with that intention, we try to measure the rheological properties of the bauxite residue. So which includes measurement of the viscosity and yield stress. 
So based on this, we can categorize the flow characteristics of the tailings material. So it is important that uh, the tailings material is characterized for the flow behavior so that uh, we can understand whether it is behaving like a Newtonian fluid or non-Newtonian fluid. So here we have used a uh, dynamic shear rheometer. So to understand the flow behavior of the tailings material, uh, especially uh, we conducted uh, on the paste materials. What we have done is uh, we have initially taken some water contents which are above and below the liquid limit because uh, the liquid limit is said to be the triggering point of the flow behavior. But that is only the triggering point. The original flow behavior may start even before that or after that. So a few water contents which we have taken is below the liquid limit of the box shear residue and few water contents above the liquid limit. And we also try to measure what would be the undrained shear strength at such a low water content values using the range shear test. So when we try to measure the undrained shear strength at the liquid limit, what we found is it is 1.6 kilopascals for the box shear residue, which is a very, very low value. And when we talk about the rheology, we also need to talk about the suspension of the solids at the solids concentration and which particle fraction dominates the rheology of that particular tail. So therefore, uh, we have segregated the entire tailing into four varieties. The coarse tailing, the particle size above 0.425 millimeter, medium tailing 0.3 millimeter, uh, or again medium 0.15, or the 0 0.075 mm. These are the four varieties of the tailings that we have done. We have segregated. And we have tried to optimize the important parameters, which is called as a gap, op gap optimization or the C rate optimization when we try to use the dynamic shear rheometer. Uh, uh, so in our case, what we found is 0.75 millimeter of the gap and shear rate of particular value here, uh, 10 power minus three uh, centi uh, 10 power minus three per second. So that is the found as optimum shear rate. And after optimizing the gap as well as the shear rate, we try to establish the shear stress versus shear rate for different uh, fractions which is coarse tailing or the medium tailing or the pile tailing as well as viscosity versus shear rate. So these are uh, for different moisture contained values. As you can notice from here, as the moisture contained increases or the varies, the shear stress or the shear rate also varies. Similarly, the viscosity also varies with the change in moisture contained value. And this behavior is distinct among the coarse tailings or the fine tailings. So this is the same shear stress versus shear rate or the viscosity versus shear rate for the other medium tailings whose particle size ranges from 0.3 millimeter to 0.425 millimeter or 0.15 millimeter to 0.3 millimeter. So now, uh, once we got the response in the form of shear stress to shear rate, now we need to find it out the whether this material is behaving like a Newtonian fluid or non-Newtonian fluid. So for that purpose, we need to fit those response into the equation of tau is equals tau y plus eta b into gamma power n. And the n is a flow index, which is unique depending upon the waste material type. Now, interestingly, in our case, so for all or the regardless of the fraction of the tailing, uh, all fractions exhibited requirements some kind of the initial yield stress. So without that, these tailings uh, will not exhibit the flow behavior. However, the initial yield stress requirement varies depending upon the fraction of the tailing material. And there is also a variability in the flow index of uh, that particular fraction of the material. So this is the response of the yield stresses versus solid concentration. So as the solid concentration increases, the yield stress either decreases or increases. For example, if you take a particular fraction, for example, the coarse, uh, the coarse fraction exhibited a requirement of the low yield stress, though the solid concentration is varying from uh, 60, uh, 68 to 73 percentage. But it is completely reversed in case of the fine fraction. In case of the fines fraction, uh, there may be a significant yield stress might be required to start the flow behavior of the tailings material. So again, so this depends on this kind of the flow behavior is unique for different tailings material. It varies from tailings to tailings. And within the same tailing, it also governed by 
what kind of the deposition or the segregation that is occurring near to the dike. Uh, if the force fraction is dominant at the dike, then we can understand though the yield stress is very less, there is a possibility of the dike failure. If fine tailings are depositing near the dike, then there may be a requirement of the high yield stress. So in order to initiate the flow behavior. Now, the last part of this presentation is uh, when we try to utilize the tailings material. So that is called as waste valorization. So do we need to give any kind of importance to the chemical composition of this material? Now, one of the aspects uh, that we are trying to use is uh, try to develop alkali activated or the geopolymer concrete uh, with exclusive use of waste material. Maybe. Uh, we can use the fly ash alone or the fly ash with the combination of the any other waste material. Uh, here we use the waste as the precursor material and to it we add the alkaline solutions such as sodium hydroxide or the sodium silicate uh, in a required composition that need to be optimized. And we also use the other conventional materials like a sand or the coarse aggregate so that the outcome product is a solid uh, hardened substance that is called alkali activated concrete or geopolymer concrete. Now, when we talk about the precursor material that is a waste material, how shall I decide whether a single waste material is sufficient enough or uh, how shall I decide this waste material shall be combined with the other waste material, for example, fly ash with the rices or the fly ash with the red mud or Shall I go for the combination of more than two varieties of the waste materials like a fly ash, slag, or the rice husk, or the fly ash, or the silica fume, or the slag? How shall we decide? So, for this purpose, we need to again understand intricately the oxides composition of these waste materials or the tailings materials which are produced by the different industries. So, this slide presents a summary of oxides composition of different materials. So, here I have taken four uh, important oxides composition. So such as SiO2, Al2O3, uh, CaO and Fe2O3. Now uh, for development of the any geopolymer concrete or for that matter, alkali activation. So we always require silicates and aluminates because the alkali solutions dissolve and dissociate only the silicates and the aluminates. However, for strength aspect, we require some kind of the binding agent that is in the form of the CAO. But on the other hand, a few waste materials might compose of excess amount of the iron oxide, for example, bauxite residue or gerosite. Now, what is the positive and the negative aspects of these oxides composition uh, on the development of the geopolymer concrete or the ultimate strength of the concrete material? And this also gives Suppose if I look at uh, intricately the chemical composition, uh, the combination should give an idea what combination of the waste material in the verticals should be selected. For example, fly ash is rich in SiO2 and Al2O3, but red mud is rich in only iron contained. There is absence of silicates and aluminates. So that means uh, I can combine the fly ash with the red mud. Or for example, when you are dealing with the steel slag, so uh, steel slag again doesn't have much, uh, it has a reasonable amount of the silicates, aluminates and steel. So steel slag alone can be used for development of the geopolymer concrete, but ensuring that other oxide compositions are in minimal quantity. So again, uh, if you look at the same uh, tailings material, but with a different horizon, so there may be a chance that the same oxide compositions might differ, differ from horizon to horizon. So this also need to take into account. Now here now we try to compile what would be the impact of these oxides composition on the development of the strength of the geopolymer concrete or alkali activated concrete. So suppose on the left side it is showing the seven days compressive strength development. On the right side it is showing the 28 days compressive strength development and of the influence of the individual oxide component, oxide composition on the overall strength. Now, though uh, it may not be correct to draw the individual composition because when we try to add uh, these precursor material, 
so they might be available in the combinations but this could give an idea so based on which we can select the combination of the materials so now we also try to combine what is the ultimate impact of oxides composition on the strength of the geopolymer compound so suppose if you look at uh, on the right side uh, if i take red mud exclusively the strength development is uh, much low it is hardly 10 uh, 10 megapascals which may not be sufficient enough uh, for use in the practical uh, practical uses similarly uh, uh, when we try to use the fly ash uh, as a alone material the low calcium fly ash or high calcium fly ash so the low calcium fly ash yield high compressive strength as compared with the high calcium fly ash similarly slag slag alone yield low compressive now based on this one or uh, if you look at the x axis the slags have yield highest compressive strength while the red mud has yield lowest compressive strength and the fly ash just in between now there is also the another aspect uh, when i when any particular tailing material is rich in only one particular oxide composition when we add the alkaline content sometimes there may be a requirement of uh, elevated curing or sometimes it may not be requiring the any elevated curing so that part also uh, it is important to look so that's all uh, my presentation so as a closing remark uh, what we noticed is uh, every tailing material is unique in its uh, chemical and mineralogical composition uh, as the understanding uh, may be physical or the chemical of different tailings materials is is that still a nascent state so therefore the characterization becomes a central point but this requires considerable energy and effort because when we talk about the tailings material there are several variety of the tailings material and uh, uh, majority of the tailings material exhibit behavior which is a contrary to conventional soils for example uh, some tailings exhibit the flow behavior while other tailings might not and within the flow behavior some tailings might exhibit newtonian behavior some might exhibit non newtonian behavior meaning thereby some tailings might require initial yield stress some might not require initial yield stress and some tailings might exhibit plastic behavior others may not be now this again depends upon majority or most of the tailings material they are absence of minerals which are typically found in the soils but at exhibits the plastic behavior or the flow behavior so for sustainable management of the tailings uh, it is uh, very important to characterize but that characterization is very expensive affair so we need to invest lot of uh, amount for understanding the behavior of the tailings now in regards to or as regards to utilization of the tailings because every tailing material require huge amount of the space or land acquisition which is practically impossible in the current scenario acquired by any industry so therefore this becomes one of the critical issue when we try to uh, talk about management of the tailings material but this utilization again linked with the amendment of the tailing material now when we try to uh, or when we try to talk about the amendment of the tailings uh, in most of the situations the commonly employed additives of might not be efficient or a single additive may not be uh, performing very well so how do you select a single additive or how do you select what should be the basis for the selection of more than one type of the additive now another important aspect is the environmental acceptability of the tailings material say the amended ones or unamended ones uh, or the conversion of the tailings materials into environmentally benign material so these two aspects so we have to go a long way to make them acceptable in terms of the environmental uh, or the pollution footprint but uh, the new novel additives like biopolymers or geopolymers which are found to be very promising because these biopolymers or geopolymers they could able to address the multiple properties for example uh, they could able to address the dispersion uh, erosion or the dust emission by simultaneously improving the strength of the waste material so these however these need to be explored
So thank you so much.